Okay. Um, we will see the various categories of floating craft and structures. If possible, we will try to compartmentalize, separate them to various categories so that you can see the categories in a little more detail. What are the characteristics of each ship type? So starting with, if I say that uh, the entire floating craft and structures can be subdivided into two groups. I write the two groups as inland and seagoing. Of these, I can go on subdivide, subdividing each category further. For example, inland, I can say propelled vessels, non-propelled, and pleasure crafts. Similarly, if I to subdivide the seagoing category, I can make two broad categories, transport and non-transport. Right? Now, I'll just first categorize all the ship types and then we'll go into each type a little bit to see their characteristics. Transport vehicles and craft at sea, we can divide them into bulk, general, and passenger. Now bulk cargo again, you are perhaps aware of all this, but let us complete the scenario, liquid and solid. And in liquid, you have liquefied gas, chemicals and oil. Oil of course, you have the crude oil carriers and the product tankers. Solid bulk, you have various types of bulk carriers, grain, ore, etc. One type of liquid cargo which is not mentioned here, I would like to mention it here is slurry. We will see whether slurry carriers are slightly different from others in due course. General cargo ships, again, there are two types in a brake bulk. You understand what is brake bulk and unitized. Cargo ships and cargo liners. And do you know the difference between these two types? What is a liner? Yes. A liner is a ship that has fixed routes at scheduled times of departure and arrival. Okay. Unitized cargo, you have container ships. What other unitized cargo can you think of? Roller and roller and barge carriers, packet, CB carriers, etc. Passenger ships, I will name two types only. 
You have heard of these cruise ships? Hmm? And ferry. Cruise ships can be a liner. Cruise is generally a liner ship. And you see, the principle of ferry and roro are same. Same principle of horizontal loading of vehicles is utilized. There are sometimes combination carriers such as oil and bulk, etc. You see, you have this obo ships, container and cargo. Uh, you have the multipurpose ships, containers and uh, You have your multipurpose ships. Like that. Now, if we see the non transport sector, that is more interesting because this is much more varied technologically than transport sector. I will call the first category as industrial vessels. Next, service vessels. Next, you have military vessels. And first, finally, you have pleasure car. What industrial vessels can we think of? First industrial vessel that comes to mind is fishing vessels. Then you have oil exploration and oil production. Two other industrial activities I have mentioned in my previous lecture, ocean mining, ocean energy. Okay, these are all industrial vessels. There are another category of industrial vessels I am not mentioning here. That is when a transport vessel is owned and operated by an industrial house whose business is not shipping. For example, a cement company may have a cement carrier used to transport cement to its various points of distribution along the coast. That is a transport vessel originally, but used by industrial house. So the economics of this vessel is not calculated in the same manner as that of a transport vessel. Do, do you get my point? We do not calculate the income and expenditure of this vessel like we would do for a transport vessel because it does not have any income. It is used or owned by the industrial house. It is doing transportation required by the industrial house. Hence, it does not have an income. Nobody pays for it. So, you cannot calculate the economic viability of such a ship. Such vessels are also a category of industrial vessels which I am not mentioning here because technologically they are a transport vessel. Service vessels, I suppose we know tugs, dredgers, supply vessels, a category of vessels that is very much in demand today, supply vessels. Ice breakers, cable laying ships, and survey vessels, survey and research vessels. These are all service vessels 
which provides service on payment of a fee. Sometimes these research vessels do not, may not get a fee for doing certain activities like those vessels owned by government of India or the Navy, then there is no payment for them. But otherwise, they have an income which is slightly different from the type of income we get from transportation of cargo. The income is against providing a service. Military vessels, on the other hand, are a totally different uh, kind of ships which do not follow the normal economic analysis of a commercial vessel. What types of vessels can we name? Battleships, that is offensive vessels and defensive vessels such as frigates and cruisers and we have a type of vessel I am writing is separately because this requires a whole lot of different things. Minesweepers. Support vessels. Military vessels have a large number of support vessels. Troop carriers, tank carriers, supply of fuel oil at sea, so on and so forth. Submarines. Yes, submarines, a whole new class of vessels. Pleasure craft. Why have I put it as a separate class? It could have gone under industrial or service vessels. Put it because this category of vessels is completely different as we see the pleasure craft today from the rest of the vessels technologically. You have, of course, normal boats, training boats, hydrofoils, hovercraft. surface effect ships, catamarans, what else? Okay, the new type of things that are coming up, floating hotels, includes hotel restaurants, yachts, yes. And finally, a very new concept, floating habitat. Yeah, okay, that is, that is simpler. But a floating habitat is completely different. Uh, in 2002, naval architect, one of the naval architect issues, mentions about a floating habitat whereas it's, it's, it's coming up somewhere in the North Sea, near Norway. Some Norwegian company is building it, so I assume it is coming up near Norway, but I'm not quite sure. About 100 accommodation complexes are being imagined at sea for, a, of course, very high paying clientele. So we have all these things coming up, this is all coming under the pleasure category. So the most uh, advanced technical developments have been originating from the pleasure side and slowly finding its use in the other areas such as military, military areas for example. We have uh, all these crafts, all the crafts that I have used can find their application in military areas. One, another difference in the pleasure crafts in uh, these different uh, vessels is that, of course, their mechanics yeah. is quite different from the normal ships. Do you understand this? I'll explain. Let's say when you have a ship floating in water, 
we know that displacement is equal to weight. This is the flotation principle, Archimedes principle, isn't it? Displacement means weight of the water displaced, which we call buoyancy. That is equal to what? Such vessels are called displacement craft. Okay. Now, when you want to move a vessel faster than this, you have a problem because these vessels we will see in, I hope you will see it in the resistance class that you cannot move a vessel very fast in displacement mode. There comes a speed barrier beyond which you cannot move a vessel. So, more or less the speed is limited for vessels which are purely supported by displacement. So, if you want to move a vessel faster than a displacement vessel, then you have to take the support of a dynamic force acting upwards. The vessel must come out of water, partially or fully. Do you get it? So, then you have what is called semi displacement. or fully planing hull, right. So, what happens? If this was the water line in displacement mode when the vessel was standing still, when it starts moving, this water line comes down. like this, the vessel lifts, right. And as the speed increases, it goes to a reg region which is called fully planing, the vessel completely lifts itself from water. That is, it just skims the water surface. All of the vessels that are written here are worked on this principle of lift. What is a hydrofoil boat? You have got hydrofoils below, which provides enough lift that the boat comes out of the water totally supported only by foils which are inside water providing lift upwards. A surface effect ship or a hovercraft work on the principle of pushing air down so that you get an upward thrust. So, the vessel lifts itself above the water surface and it moves forward. So, that is the way you can get more speed and all these are possible in the under the pleasure craft category. Okay. So, anyway, I think we will now concentrate on uh, inland water scenario before we go very far away. My intention is to bring the inland water craft into focus. We discussed this inland water category, three types of vessels we discussed, propelled, non-propelled and pleasure. Can we name some main inland waterways that are used for carriage of cargo internationally? Internationally. Can we name some? Uh, I am asking about waterways. Waterways. Name some waterways that are used for carriage of cargo internationally. Mississippi, yes. Yeah, okay. Mississippi, St. Lawrence, UA. I am asking about major. Amazon, there is small amount of movement, but not really major. Nile. Nile, is it used in a major way now? Uh, yeah. Zambezi. Sorry? Zambezi. Zambezi. Some movement is there. I do not think so there is a large movement. Only two major lines. Yeah. Come back to Europe. Europe shows the way. <laughs> Rhine. Rhine moves through the Ruhr Valley in Germany and maximum amount of iron ore and other minerals are transported through this one river Rhine and to some extent Danube. Okay. Now, 
St. Lawrence Seaway, of course, you are very well aware. There are about 26 locks in this seaway. This seaway is partly man-made. The rejoining of the lakes going up is partly man-made and the water is controlled through locks. So the vessel actually lifts itself. As it goes through the St. Lawrence Seaway, it lifts itself from water level through a locking system. Okay. Now we have uh, these waterways well established. There have been large amount of cargo movement in these waterways. Why doesn't it take place in India? Or let's see what can be the character. Oh, first, let us see what can be the characteristics of vessels that move in these rivers, as distinctly different from ocean-going vessels. Can we identify some? For example, if you take the main difference between river and sea, the sea experiences waves, right? And the inland water vessel does not experience wave. So what does it uh, indicate to us? What, what sort of change in characteristics of the vessel will be there because it does not experience waves? The probability of damage due to wave loading will be much less, right? Therefore, structures will be simpler because loading is less, which is less heavy than a sea going vessel. Also, since damage probability will be low, speedboard requirement will be less stringent that than that of an ocean going vessel. What else is different from sea and river? The sea is wide open and the vessel can go anywhere after it leaves port. River on the other hand is meandering. It has got a problem of draft and it has got a problem of width and the direction in which it goes. It restricts the vessel size tremendously. Therefore, you cannot have the same vessel moving in different waterways. You have to design vessels for the particular waterways. Length of the vessel, which is a primary variable of the size of the vessel, will be restricted by the meandering characteristics of the river because you have to maneuver the vessel inside the river, right? This automatically leads to the other other feature of uh, inland water vessels, it cannot be very fast. Speed will be low because if it is a very fast moving boat, a big ship, big boat, it will be difficult for it to man uh, maneuver the winding characteristics of the river. Since it is moving at low speed, you see see the problem that is coming up. You are moving the vessel at low speed, but you want to maneuver it quickly. The little bit we know about the steering characteristics of the vessel will tell us that we require a large moment to turn the ship, which should be provided by the rudder. So the rudder should be able to give that torque. Okay. On the other hand, we are not having a high speed on the rudder. Do you understand? Because the vessel is moving slowly. So how do you get this? Invariably, you will find the rudders of inland water vessels are very large. It's only area that will give you higher torque. So inland vessels will have a higher rudder area. So these are some of the characteristics of a propelled vessel. Now there is one solution to this. A river vessel will call at many river ports and depending on the availability of cargo, it may get full load, it may not get full load. One of the solutions that have been thought of 
in river transport is the tug barge system which originated from river transport. You might have heard of tug barge system at sea, but tug barge system actually originated from river transport where you have smaller units, smaller dump units for carrying cargo and one propelled unit to move them around. So, if you have large number of dump units, you join them together and one unit can move them around. So, you have two systems, one you have a push towing system and another is pull towing. So, here you can have different combinations of barges. A tug which pushes the barges forward or a pull towing system the tow hook is there you pull the barges this barge combinations can be various forms you can also have barges abreast each other okay so this formation of barges is called flotillas so the advantage of this is you are actually the cargo carrying unit and the engine unit you are separating. So, you can manage this separately if the engine requires repair and it goes to repair, but the barges are available to be pushed around by another engine unit. And then the other advantage that accrues distinctly from one single unit is that you need not carry the whole flotilla every time. Depending on your cargo availability, you can manipulate your flotillas. So, you have the least movement possible for carriage of cargo. So, you have these self propelled barges and flotilla formations. Then you have the other category called pleasure craft. What sort of pleasure craft do you move in rivers? Yeah, you can tell me. You have uh, these paddle boats that you see in almost all the lakes, but you can also go for this higher level pleasure crafts we have talked about in river water, provided you get a big waterfront. The planing boats, the hydrofoils, etc., you cannot move if the waterfront available is small. So, if you have got large waterfront, you can move all these boats in various types. Okay, so these are the different types of uh, vessels in inland waters. Let us look at the Indian scenario. What do we see? What do we see in the Indian scenario? Do we have any? inland water transportation in this country. Can you tell me? It, it is somewhere there in the south near Kerala. Near Kerala, okay. I write Kerala here. And Brahmaputra river right from here to Brahmaputra. Brahmaputra. Ganges. What do you have? Brahmaputra and Ganges, I can understand are rivers. What do you have in Kerala? Pleasure boats. No, the boat. No. We are talking of the boat race. Not boat race. Uh, actually, people have come out with a, you know, a floating thing, which is, you know, like for the purpose of honeymoon or something like that, floating hotel type of thing. Where? It's going it going not, where? Not, it is not going to the hotel. You remain there on board. Okay. So you have backwaters of Kerala. 
Okay. Backwaters of Kerala have been typical characteristics. They go right from Cochin till Quilon, Trivandrum. And they go parallel to the coastline, the sea water. And uh, at places, the width is as low as 32 meters. But otherwise, there is a good width. So you can move some boats around. See, the Indian scenario is very peculiar with regard to inland water transport. The two types of use of water for transportation is there in India. One is for people whom, for whom the water is a way of life. Okay, like Dal Lake in Kashmir. You have shops and boats. You have collection of vegetables and materials from boats. People move... Uh, I'm not talking of pleasure boats. I'm talking of the way of life. Everybody who is having a house on the lake front has also a boat at a, tied to the lake. And he just moves in the boat and uh, does his business rather than taking out a cycle and going on the road. It's the way of life. Same thing you'll notice in Kerala. Same thing, exactly same thing you'll notice in Kerala. These young girls of seven, eight years also get into a that round boat which you might have seen, a, flo a floating uh, a vessel of the shape of a round. So she sits in that and she has got a small little boat, a small little oar or two oars and with that she nicely maneuvers and goes here and there visiting her friends and things like that. Also some amount of business is done through these inland water boats like vegetables. If you go to Ernakulam, there is a vegetable market on water where people bring vegetables from hinterland by boats and come there. Okay, and the trading is done across the waterfront. This is one type where it's a way of life. People live by water and some amount of business is staying. What about commercial activity, transportation for as a means of business, organized transportation or even unorganized transportation of cargo on demand? Is it there? If you look at Indian history, till 1962, we had good transportation, particularly in the Gangetic Basin, Calcutta to Assam, and up, upstream up to maybe up to Allahabad. I'm not quite sure whether it's Allahabad, but definitely up to Patna. Up to Allahabad, yes. Up to Pandu, yes. This transportation that was there was again organized transportation was there. The main company that did this transportation in the Ganges was called River Steam Navigation Company, RSN, British owned company, transport to Indian owners after independence. Then there was this privately owned boat operators who also moved some amount of cargo along the Ganges and most of these boats were sailed propelled and propelled by wind and were made from wood by traditional skill. It was made by traditional skill. There was no architecture or no naval architecture, no design drawings and they are built by virtue of the skill passed on from father to son. 1962, we had the Indo-Pak war. It changed the scenario completely. Organized transportation in the Ganges died. Died so badly that till 40 years now, it hasn't got up yet. What we have in the Ganges, that is in the Sundarban area of West Bengal, a large number of boats that, you, that are mainly used for transporting people across the river. These boats are also wooden boats made from traditional skills. The only thing they have done is that they remove the sail and put a small 9 HP or 13 HP engine with a domestically made shaft and a propeller, a crude propeller which is cast in bulk in Calcutta, some Calcutta foundry of made of cast iron and they move. But as a good business practice, 
hardly any movement of cargo is there in the Ganges Basin, which is indeed very sad. In India, large amount of cargo is moved by river only in Goa. That is, the Mandovi and Juari river system are used extensively for movement of cargo by river. And that has given rise to the so-called uh, Goa barges. Have you seen Goa barges? You should see. Yeah. So a lot of barges are there and they are quite uh, standard. The, uh, all of 80 meters, 80 meters, there is more or less 80 meters, some few barges are 100 meters, not more than that because the river system cannot take more length than that. Some of these barges have the sea going characteristic to go up to the loading point which is beyond the port about 5 nautical miles. They have some bulk carriers which come which, is, which cannot come to the port and they stay out outside the port area and these barges. These barges, these barges normally very often in fact, it goes from Goa, depending upon the season, it goes up to Gujarat uh, uh, for, for doing that surf basin, you know, a lot of uh, cargo activities are taking place there also. Okay. So, you see, in the last 15 years, yes, from the 8th plan period onwards, the government of India has taken up inland water transport uh, sector in a bit more serious way than what it was before. And it has declared the stretch of river from Calcutta to um, to Faraka as waterway number one, national waterway number one, and uh, similarly a stretch uh, in this uh, eastern sector, I think beyond Bangladesh to um, Gowati as waterway number two, and Kerala backwaters as waterway number three, and ten waterways have been identified. The problem with these waterways is that they require to be maintained. We have seen that the vessel movement is very much restricted because of the craft and because of the meandering nature of the river. So we require a maintenance of depth on the river throughout the year if we have to have a uh, economic and viable transportation system along the river. We also require infrastructure to be built up on the river banks like ports, cargo handling gear and connectivity to hinterland by means of roads or rails. Unless this is given, it is very difficult for the inland water transport sector to come up. But why do we need this to come up? Is there a need for such a sector to come up at all or uh, we should rather invest that money in the road and rail sector? That is the question I believe many politicians must be asking. The answer to that is if well developed, then water transport is the cheapest. Okay, And if you do the calculations of operating expenses on the uh, on the basis of turn mile of cargo moved then you will find that the waterway transport system is less than half of road or rail transport therefore it is necessary to be developed because it's cheaper form of transport provided we can provide the infrastructure another reason why water transport must be developed is in a country like India, <coughs> road and rail are very much overloaded. We see that every day in paper. Overloading, lack of maintenance and therefore accidents. We have these problems in road and rail which are increasing day by day. 
So if we can develop our water transport, then these problems are likely to reduce. The other thing which is important for us to understand is that all the rivers meet the sea somewhere, isn't it? So once we are talking of uh, container transport, for container transport has shown the way. What is the principle of container transport? It is a door to door delivery system. That means the road, rail, sea and at the other end the same road or rail, they are all integrated into one system. So that uh, it can be organized and managed in a better manner. Can we not also put water along with road and rail? Is it possible to devise intermodal transport between river and sea? If that can be done, not only for carriage of containers, but also many other things. Typical examples is key from Assam. Does it have to come by road to Calcutta to be loaded on a export ship? Or can it come by river where the not only the transportation cost is less, but also the cost of storage and handling at uh, port is much reduced. These are the things for which one must look at inland water transport in a much more serious manner than what we have done so far. The pollution aspect of doing the transportation by ship or by I mean water mode. The pollution is also very less compared to if you are doing it by road and other mode of transportation. Pollution is less, yes, yes. Basically, you consume less fuel. Yeah, but but you cannot take. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, there is there is one problem. You carry cargo slowly. River generally will cargo ca carry cargo slowly. Speeds we have seen one of the characteristics of water transport carrying large amount of cargo is that it must move slowly. Right. So that is one problem which will come up. All this uh, pollution and this that, uh, you will have to compromise with uh, the extra time you are spending. You are spending extra time. But if you maybe, as you rightly said, if you have an intermodal system, then an extra time can be reduced. Yeah, but yeah, it yeah. It is an integrated, like how containerization has right. reduced the delivery time. But uh, another thing is that uh, most of the cargo which is carrying the when people are ordering the cargo, this is only for a business point of view. If he has ordered it, that it should reach me in two days. So this thing picks up. He will order it in four days, that it should reach me in four days. No, that's true. He will, businessmen will more order it accordingly. Operation can be more No, that is true. But uh, as of now, Waterways transport is mo more uncertain than road or rail transport. So that is because we have not developed it. Yes. Right. Another thing is uh, because this IWAI which we have, the Indian Waterways Authority of India, it is doing a lot of new construction as well as uh, repairs at Calcutta all the time. One problem that they are facing is a strong resistance by the truck lobby. Yeah. Once they reach a space, it has to go into trucks. And the truck lobby, because it is hitting at the roofs, mm -hmm. they would prefer to take it from Calcutta to Allahabad than to take it. You should reach that road. So they are facing a bit, they refuse to take the stuff. Yes, that is true. There, there will be lobbies which will oppose water movement. But then time should uh, uh, settle it. Fact, you all might be knowing there was a move to make some floating luxury. Uh, thing between some place in Madhya Pradesh up to Udaipur. You know, something like floating on wheels, a uh, palace on wheel. They wanted to make something like palace on water. water. 
Uh, it's, it's a very, I mean, when you were showing that uh, flotillas, you know, the project was something like two flotillas only. Mm. I mean, it, it is around 30 meters wide uh, river which is connecting MP and uh, going up to the river. And that is also coming uh, under that uh, tourism belt. It was in fact formed by the Ministry of Tourism to start something like that. Well, uh... What IWA is doing now is transport between two places within the river. It's not going straight from Calcutta to Patna. They have taken some, constructed something, takes it to Patna, maybe Patna to a small place. And then bending the channel down. The, the problem is, as I understand, is that the inland waterways have now been thrown open to private operators. It is now open one can operate a boat but the private operators are not coming forward mainly because of the economic factors do not prompt him to go into this venture because there is no uh, profit for him that has to be overcome that has to be overcome I understand because one wants to, de to declare it as an infrastructure yeah. A new infrastructure project which entitles you to software loans. And then the other thing I thought was uh, night, light, night navigation. Night navigation is a problem. Is a problem, which again the state said from Yeah. Night navigation is not there. Night navigation, the draft, the, the charts which are available, they are inadequate. Because it is, as you said, it was redundant to be for us for people. And uh, also like the private operator which would come with like, like cement plants which are up the river. But then he has to make an investment. Yeah. Whereas the other way he just hires set trucks or a train road. He does not make any no, capital no, investment. Take the case of Guja and Guja. They have uh, their own field of 12 vessels, cement carriers. And you can see that they look at uh, their plant. And they are saying, uh, coming to Bombay, discharging it here. Only Bombay. Bombay yes. and some place in Surat also. Ah, Surat and Bombay. Bombay. That, that's the route, isn't it? Ah, that's the Between route. Gujarat and Bombay. But Surat, if you are coming, then you are going to that river, that Mandala river. So come into mm -hmm. that. And it's a beautiful ship. 12 ships they have got. Well maintained, beautiful ship. But not for inland waterways. Mm -hmm. yeah, coast. But that also leads to coastal uh, scenario. Yes. You see, uh, um, sometimes it is easier to integrate coastal shipping with inland shipping rather than international shipping with inland shipping. So perhaps we should be looking at coastal shipping emanating from this. Perhaps it is necessary for us to look at coastal shipping more seriously. Coastal, yeah? coastal shipping has come up in a big way the last 15 years. Um, can't say in a big way really. No, but there is a it has come up. No, but there is a problem of uh, at this stage in the coastal shipping is not doing very good mm -hmm. because of the freight charges. So, you know, it came up and then it has again stopped. And in all the 1,500, 1,500, 2,000 tons, a lot of vessels were made in Mangala shipyards. Mm -hmm. But it has again stopped due to this cargo problem. They are not even getting, say, around 50,000 per day freight charges. That, that is right. Actually, the economics of inland water uh, movement is complete, or even coastal movement, is completely different from merchant ships. Completely, because one is controlled by national boundaries and the other is not controlled by national boundaries. International transportation, for example, you compare all your costs at international market, including freight rate. Whereas when you come to the national boundaries, your freight rate will be dictated by the rail and road freight rate that is existing, not by the freight rate existing at sea. And you can, typical example I'll give you, uh, Madras to Singapore, an empty container transport costs eighty dollars. We will pay eighty dollars in equivalent rupees for the same distance in India if I am moving an empty container. Eighty dollars is two thousand uh, rupees. Who will pay? That will not come. So you will not cost the same if you are moving an empty container over that uh, like uh, one and a half thousand or two miles over land. I don't think so. I don't think so. 
I don't think so. Plus handling. Plus handling. It's a lot of money. In the international scenario, even freight rates are different from national scenario. Um, and this we have seen. This, this, there is a uh, difference in grade. Anyway, uh, there is a lot of scope in uh, inland water transport and particularly in the pleasure sector. Uh, I think we will be seeing in near future a lot of uh, movement as you mentioned uh, in uh, flo not flo hotels, floating hotels, then the tourism circuit. Uh, you mentioned one, I will mention another one that is uh, from Calcutta to Mayapur and uh, Gaya. This is a sector which will pick up through the river. I am thinking and of course luxury tourists and uh, another project in which we are involved at uh, IIT Kharagpur is the floating city project in the Sundarban area. That is something which is also going to come up. I believe a lot of people are thinking of providing uh, luxury facil tourist facilities on the rivers, on the sheltered water or semi sheltered waters. The Sundarban project is one we are involved in, but I am told that a lot of such projects are in various uh, stages of uh, planning. I believe ITC is looking at uh, tourism, tourism facilities on river Ganges again. Ganges happens to be the uh, most attractive river so far. Okay, thank you. Back to this. So one